whole chapter. Psalm 71. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. I am as a wonder unto many, thou, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one that is to come. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who hast done great things, O God, who is like unto thee. Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I also will praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou holy one of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul where thou hast redeemed, which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Here Psalm 71, as often is, is, is David just musing of the things of God and his relationship with him. And I love looking at these Psalms and, and seeing, you know, even before and after it. Psalm 72 says a Psalm for Solomon. Before that, there's a Psalm of David to bring to remembrance. David was often reflecting and, and he's often thinking about the generations to come, as you see, as he made a Psalm specifically for his son. He's talking here of the relationship with God. And in verse 1 it says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. He's saying to his heart, essentially, internalizing it, O Lord, I trust, I believe, I, I hope in thee. Let me never be put to confusion. And I think every day we ought to start there. Start with... God, let me trust in you. God, I want to trust in you. Psalm 118 verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in men. And really, if we're not trusting God, our confidence is either in ourselves, a man, a woman, right? Or it's in one other, another man or woman. Because what else is there in this world? where We're putting our trust and our faith and our belief upon a person or even a thing. But even things are, are, are something tangible and not of God when that's what we're counting on to be our safety and our refuge. Better to put your trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. He says, in thee, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. 
Confusion is, is uncertainty, okay? It's bewilderment. It's when things are unclear. That, that's confusion. It's, it's cloudy. It's a state of being disordered or in panic. You know, when we look and we see those protests going on out in the streets, that's, that's confusion. That's disorderly. That's panic. That, that's bewilderment. It's uncertain. It's unclear. It, it's, it's confounding. It's confusion. And we know that God is not the author of confusion. Okay? God is not the one that is in control and directing people in such states. If you're confused today, God didn't author that. God didn't write that. God didn't ordain that into your life. And never more is that more true than when it's regard to this book. He's not the author of confusion, but he certainly did author a book for us. He certainly did have holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, took those words and had them on tables of stone or on, 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 on pieces of paper or on lambskin, sheepskin, whatsoever, had it transmitted and translated through time in Greek and Hebrew and some of Aramaic, and then eventually it spanned the time of the Dark Ages, found its way onto English in the English language and we have it and behold it and we can put our faith and our trust in that rather than have confidence in a man or any man to that extent confusion will always come when you're putting confidence in something that God didn't author okay so when your life is confusing and confounding God didn't author that and if you're putting your trust in that scenario you're 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 in a one-way ticket to just more and more problems and so David here he says let me never be put to confusion rather let me trust in you lord the bible says in psalm 20 some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will remember the name of our lord god the name of the lord our god and we know that his name is high and lifted up as it is and we learned about three different names that jesus gave himself in revelation 19 today we know no matter how high and important his name is for there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved right the name of jesus christ no matter how important his name is he has magnified his word above all his name and so that's where we need to put our confidence and our trust there should never be confusion in our lives that is a surrounding this word the only reason that I can stand as firm and confident on my convictions and beliefs as I do is because I have his word. And he promised that his word was not authored in, a, in the context of confusion. Those things are, are, are completely different, foreign one to another. If God authored it, it's not confusing. Sure, there may be things that I don't understand, but the gray matter is not in the word. The gray matter is between my ears. That's, that's when, when there's confusion surrounding the word of God. It's not because the word of God is not pure, righteous, just, 100% accurate, 100% uh, pure and without fault and without error. No, no, no. The, the confusion is always between my ears. God didn't author that either. My own thoughts and wills and intents quite often bring that confusion into my life. Now, back in the context of Psalm chapter 71... He says this in verse 2. He says, Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. He says, Deliver me. He says, Save me. His righteousness then in this context is our escape. And our escape from hell is the exact same way. His righteousness. We are delivered. We are saved because his righteousness has provided that we could escape. We just have to receive his righteousness by faith. Once we believe on Christ, he takes all of his goodnesses and it covers up our badness, our sin, our wickedness. And we become righteous in the sight of the God the Father at that time. It's our escape from sin, from hell, from death. It's our deliverance. It's our salvation, his righteousness. That's what we can lean on. That's what we can trust in. Verse 3 says this. It says, Be thou! My strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. He says, be thou. In other words, he's asking God to be the strong habitation. He's asking God to be the rock. He's asking God to be his fortress at this time. And God isn't just, isn't just nailed down he, he's not like a, a a a fortress or an habitation or a rock would be where where it's immobile and it's stuck 
We know that the Lord God is everywhere. He's all powerful. He's all omnipotent. He's, he's everywhere, going to and fro in the earth. He's, he, he sees all. He knows all. And so when we make him our habitation, it's not like we're stuck somewhere. It's not like we're grounded and can't move. But rather, if we hide ourselves in Christ and he's our habitation, then we can go wherever. We can do whatever. We're not limited by anything in this life because we've hid ourselves in God. So that's why the psalmist here in great revelation of, of some truths that were probably fresh or maybe even not fully revealed in the scriptures prior to this, he knows that in Christ is where eventually he will dwell. And that is the safest spot. That is the sure position. That's where you can trust and never be put to confusion in him. So he says to God, be thou, and he is, our habitation. Be thou, and he is our rock. Be thou, and he is our fortress. Whenever we are in trouble, he's the one that keeps us safe. And we go with him whithersoever he goes, and he goes with us whithersoever we go, if we're doing things according to his will and following after him. Verse 4 continues, says, Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel men. And that's when we're safe in the habitation and rock that is God. We are safe from the wicked and the unrighteous, safe from the attacks that they would have upon us. We're, we're, we're given, we're given a, a, a place to inhabit and to live in whereby fiery darts can't touch us because we're surrounded by God and we're protected. Of course, sometimes the wicked and the unrighteous are going to be able to influence our lives and cause troubles to enter in. But those weren't uh, there but by the provision of God and the allowance of God. If God allows for a trial to come in by way of some wicked individual or some unrighteous person, then he's doing that with the intent of growing you and helping you in the end. He allows for wicked people to hurt Christians sometimes in order that he would get glorified and the Christian would be purified and made stronger through that challenge and that trial. It says here, of the cruel man. He says, deliver me from the hand of the cruel man. Someone that is cruel is someone that willfully, willingly causes pain or suffering to others. And they just, they have no feeling or concern about it. I've seen a lot more of this, these things, these really bizarre things that are, that are coming up in the world where, where, you know, this teenager's just walking down the road and just for, for apparently no reason at all, he does something very cruel and just, just decks a 90 year old lady and hits her to the street and keeps on walking. Have you seen stuff like this? Or, or there, there was a report of, of a young child that was walking with her mom and some deranged lunatic just came up and cut the child's face just for no reason and kept carrying on. We got to keep our people close, keep our children close and, and safe at, in a day like this. But the world is full of cruel people, of course. Mm -hmm. And so you can see why it would be needful for us and why David would bring it to the forefront in Psalms to pray that we would be delivered from the wicked and unrighteous and cruel men because, because they are more and more and more prevalent in the day and time that we live in. We're seeing more and more cases of just, just unrighteousness, wickedness, and cruelness in the hearts and, of men. These random psycho attackers. I, I can't believe this stuff. Where is where is natural affection? Well, the Bible says in the last days there will be a lack of it. A natural affection doesn't want to see hurt happen to any child. It doesn't want to see hurt happen to any elderly person. The people that are weakest and most most uh, susceptible and, and, and most easily harmed. Uh, but, but yet these cruel people would do such wicked and heinous things. Pray that we could be protected from it. God deliver me from these things. Verse 5, the psalmist says, For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. And you know what? I was saved when I was 25 years old, and I would consider that my youth. I was immature. I wasn't very grown. I didn't have a good understanding, especially in the ways of this world. I might have, I might have been able to get by in the world and have like a, a full-time job and, and that sort of thing, but I was very immature at 25. I would consider that youth. And so I read a verse like this, and even David, he's saying, Hey, thou art my trust from my youth, and I have the same testimony. From my youth, from that time I turned 25, I have this trust in God that he gave to me. Since then, I've been growing in that hope and in that trust and, and maturing in the things of this life and in the things of the life which is to come through, through God's sustaining hand and through God's provision of his word entering into me and sanctifying me, sanctify me through thy truth. Thy word is truth, the Bible says, and, and I've experienced that. And, and, and uh, 
every single time I, I realize that, I can just give more praise to God and say, you know what, thou art my hope. I've trusted you from my youth. I trust you today. Help me to trust you more today. Verse 6 says, By thee I have been holden up from my womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. And we ought to praise God for all that he has done, bringing us to today when we can stand before him and hope in him and trust in him. It's amazing that it says here, I was holden up from my birth. He says that, that he was holden from the womb. He was taken from his mother's bowels. And, and honestly... He deserves my praise, and, and, and more so when I think about all of the things from birth to 25 years old that could have taken me out, that could have killed me, that could have destroyed me. God held me up from the womb. He sustained me unto such a time that I could be brought into conviction and understanding my need for a Savior when I'm sinful and I'm affront against God. And the only one that can save me is the Word of God and Jesus Christ. And I called upon Him for salvation. He held me up to that point when I was, when I was frail. And, and, and at any moment, if I was destroyed by the stupid decisions that I made, if I was destroyed by some wicked or unrighteous or cruel person just, just attacking me when I didn't have the protection of God, if I was destroyed by any of those things, I would have been destroyed forever and eternity in hell. But I'm thankful that God held me up until I got to the point where I could believe in him all the way back to the womb. And he deserves praise for that, for all he's done to sustain me. Verse 3, it says, Thou hast given commandment to save me. Okay? And I believe that at some point that was the command that rang through the host of heaven. When I was born, when I, when I, was, when I was brought and held up from the womb, that was probably the command. Hey, save Josh Gander. Okay? And it took 25 years for Josh Gander to bend to God's will and trust him by faith. Certainly there might have been times along the way where I, where I could have heard the gospel and I, and I was deterred from it or Satan doth hinder me or something happened and I couldn't have saved. But I believe that right from that time that I, I, I broke through the womb and I was birthed into this world, God sent that commandment to save me to the host of heaven. And they were just working on it every day right up until I was 25 and I finally believed in him. And you know what? I believe that same commandment is still in the ears of the hosts of heaven. Save him. You know, preserve him, work in his life, bring him on to greater things for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Verse 7, it reads this. It says, I am as a wonder to many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. And you know what? In my life, I've experienced that many have wondered and continue to wonder about me. Why is Josh, you know, he lived a certain way up to 25. Why, why is he acting this way? Why is he acting so? Why did he change? This must be just a phase. It's a, it's a wonderment for somebody who is saved later in life for their friends to witness the great change that God does in their lives. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's, it's confusing to them. But I rejoice in it. And let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day for all that you have done. Because that pathway that I was following before I was 25 was leading me to destruction. It was leading me to wear out. It was leading me to burn out and destroy myself. I was constantly sinning, did not have a savior to cover my sins. I'm still sinning today, but thanks be to God, I'm doing it less than I did before, and God has is continually faithful in washing those sins clean. Whereas before that, I was just accumulating and accumulating. The wages of sin is death. Death, 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 just accumulating and bringing more to myself. Certainly, it's a wonderful thing for somebody that knew me before to look at me and say, oh, he's preaching? <laughs> He, he's, he's leading a church in Toronto. He's reading his Bible. He doesn't drink anymore. He doesn't smoke anymore. He doesn't party anymore. He's raising his family on, on, on a single angle. What is wonderful? What is this thing? Well, this is so strange. And, and to me, though they think it's strange and wonderful, hey, God's my refuge. God's my stay. Let my mouth be filled with his praise all the day long and let that continue. God continue to make me wonderful in the eyes of the world because I want to be what you want me to be and not what they want me to be. The world wants me to 
go right back into it. You know what? They would be a lot happier. It's amazing when you talk to family members and they're upset with you because you don't drink and party and smoke and, and ignore your children to do all those things and get hung over. You don't do all those things. What's wrong with you? It's like, aren't those bad things? Like, nobody wants their child to grow up and be a drunkard, partier, waste of life, like spending all their money on stupid things, not supporting them. Nobody wants them to grow up like that. But then when I grow up and Christ saves me and works into me to be more responsible now than the path that I was going, everyone's like, no, we like that better. <laughs> you, you, li- you liked the destruction and the misery and the sickness. You like that better. But that's how the world is. But I would continually, and I desire continually to praise God and honor him all the day as he continues to lead me, as he has all this time, holding me from the womb, becoming my refuge and my stay in my youth. I pray that I would continue on even into my old age. Verse 9 says, cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. You know, God's even stronger when we're weak. And so as I get older, I just pray that, you know, when I can't bring myself upstairs, when it's hard for me to read my Bible because my eyes are all dim, when when, when my back's sore, when my knees are broke, when I I just pray that at that time, God is just doing even greater things in my weakness. I, I I pray that at that time, I will be a prayer warrior that could bring fire down, even though I can't even get out of my bed if that's God's will for me. I pray that God continues even in my my weakness of old age, even when I'm grayer than when I that I am now. I pray God that will continue God will continue to work in my life. And that is a reason to praise him all the day long. Even when my strength fails so that so that I all I can do is trust in God. I pray God that that God will be with me in the long run. I pray that he will fight for me and fight with me in those days. And that is a great reason to praise him because he promises to do these things. David's simply reminding God of stuff that God's already promised him to do. That's prayer in a nutshell. Hey God, how many times did you see Moses say, hey God, you promised to take Israel to the promised land. He brought that to God and God's, of course he didn't forget his word. But now Moses activates his word in his life by reminding the Lord of it. And we need to do the same thing. God, cast me not off in my old age. God, be my habitation. The Lord said, I am thy rock and thy habitation. Here, David's just reminding him of that. Lord, be my rock. Be my habitation. Let me trust all the day in you. Don't cast me away. I know you won't cast me away. He's reminding the Lord at this time. Verse 10, enemies enter, and it says, For mine enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together. Now today, if you don't have enemies, just wait, they're coming. (laughs) Or you just don't know about them yet. They're waiting in the wings. There's, There's always going to be enemies to the people of God. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And when they suffer persecution, it it always comes in these kind of ways. It comes as your enemies speaking against you. It comes with your enemies laying wait for you. It comes with your enemies taking counsel together, teaming up against you, like verse 10 says. Mine enemies speak against me. Your enemies will speak against you too. And they lay wait for my soul, take counsel together. Your enemies, if you don't have them now, you will, and they'll do the same thing. They will lay wait for your very soul and try to destroy you as soon as they think they have the upper hand on you. What have they said? Verse 11. What will they say to you? Saying, God hath forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. Him. And certainly in your life, whenever you're going through hardship, it happens all the time. You know, you have a setback, you have a loss. People will come to you and they'll say, didn't your God promise to care for you? You're having financial issues. I thought your God was going to care for those things. You know, they'll throw those things in your face and they'll even say, go as far as to say, God hath forsaken him. Look, a Christian's in in dust and mire, having trouble, like he lost his job, he's struggling, he's discouraged. Hey, your God hath forsaken you. And the enemy, once they think that God hath forsaken him, it's like a trap that the Lord sends. The Lord is still and remains that high tower. He is still and he remains that strong habitation, that fortress and rock to the believer. But for a moment, it seems as if he has forsaken him. Just as if, just as for a moment, it seemed that God hath forsaken Jesus on the cross. He even cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
And they're all like, yeah, God's forsaken him. Didn't the Lord say he was, he was going to protect him lest he dash his foot against the stone? Didn't you say you could heal the sick, right? Heal yourself, physician, right? They cast in his teeth these same kind of challenges that God hath forsaken him. And some people will look into your life and say, hey, your God hath forsaken you. It's like a trap, though, God lays for the enemies, right? Because he knows that some will lie in the wait, right? Some will sit off into the darkness. Some will wait for you to stumble, and that's when they're going to attack. Because a, a, a wicked person that is wise, an unrighteous and cruel man that is wise, they know that they can't take down the Christian who is strong, okay? So when the Christian seems to be weak, that's when the devils are going to move in and try to sweep in and try to, try to, try to uh, enforce their will. So certainly there are those in your life that are waiting in the wings, waiting for you to show some level of weakness, and then they will say, God has forsaken him. There are even those that believe that they have God in their corner. And feel now that because they have God in their corner and they look at you and think that you're being, you're being outside of God's will and you're not doing what God wants and therefore God has forsaken you, now they feel at liberty to persecute. And it's the same thing. Whether, whether there's somebody that seemeth to be religious and, and it thinks that they're walking with God peering into your life or whether it's just a wicked, unrighteous, and cruel person that's waiting for you to fall, looking into your life. The reaction is the same. Ah, God hath forsaken him. Now what does he say? He says, persecute and take him. Now is the time to move and attack. God hath forsaken Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. But we need to remember as Christians that that is never true. That is never the case that there is none to deliver you. Okay? Sometimes, as the psalmist indicates, sometimes you kind of have to verbalize, hey, God, protect me. God, watch over me. Remind God of the promises that he's already made. Do you know what that's for, though? That's not for God. That's for us. So when I say, God, you promised to be my stead. You promised to be my stay, my high tower. God, you promised to care for me when, when things are going rough and when I feel like he has forsaken me. It's not for God's benefit that those things are uttered. <laughs> it's for my benefit that those things are uttered because I'm reminding myself of the promises that God has made. So God has forsaken him, the enemy says. Let's persecute. Let's take him. There's none to deliver him at this time, right? Look what, look what the psalmist says, verse 12. Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste for my help. So the application here is that attacks from the enemies are going to come. What should they do for us? Right? They should cause us to seek after God more. He just finished crying out to God, asking for his help. Now the enemies look and they say, oh, God has forsaken him. It's time to persecute and destroy him. The first response of David is, Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste for my help. Enemies attack, drive us. Enemies attacks should drive us to seek God more and more and more. And when we seek God more and more, we should bring our praise with it. Continue to read in verse 13. It says, Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. So as attacks come in, as, as trouble and struggles and strife comes in to your life, as the enemies look at you and they're like, God's not working in his life, and you start to feel like, yeah, maybe God's not working in my life. Maybe I've messed up. Maybe something's going wrong. What should we do? Praise him more. Seek after him more. Ask for him more to work in your life. This is why God gives us trials and tribulations and struggles, because he wants verse 12 through 14 and uh, to, to just be more profound and real in our lives. He wants when we're in trouble to say, God, be closer to me. Don't be far from me. He wants us when we're in trouble to say, God, let the enemy be confounded. Let them be covered with reproach. He wants us to offensively attack in the realm of prayer. He wants us to have more faith, like verse 14 says, I will hope continually. He wants us to praise him and give him the glory when we say, I will yet praise thee more and more and more and more and more. This is why God gives us trials, is because he wants us to grow stronger in him and in his will. Verse 15, it says, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the days, for I know not the numbers 
thereof. Verse 16, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even thine only. We ought to go in God's strength, not in our own. And this is what happens once we start to feel like we're being pressed down by the enemy. We realize how weak we are. When faced against a mighty army, you realize how, how delicate you are. When you, have, when you have struggles in your life and everything has your back against the wall, you need to understand, hey, I'm weak now, just as I will be weak when I'm an old man, but I can, I can take the weakness that I'm experiencing now and I can, I can use it as leverage to get God to do greater things in his strength in my life. He will show forth his might his righteousness, his strength, when he has a believer that is in a position of weakness and, and ready to receive the great miracles that God's going to do. And that's what it says there in verse 16. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even thine only. That is everything. His salvation, his righteousness, his strength. We can't even know that for magnitude. How much is prepared for the believer as far as strength and sustenance and provision is. Basically, how much faith you're willing to God is give to God is how much how much great glory he's willing to impress into your life. I like that verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I don't even know the magnitude of thy righteousness. I don't even know the magnitude of thy salvation each and every day. How many times has God intervened and protected me from something that could have been disastrous? I even think now today we were at the McDonald's drive through and I was pulling out of, of the drive through after we waited I think a little bit longer than I expected to. But as soon as I rolled out somebody cut right in front of me, right? He had the right of way. I was paying attention but it still caught me off guard. He snuck up on me like that. Well, what if you know, the drive through went a little bit faster that day. And I snuck out and got hit by the, that car, right? Who knows the number thereof of God's righteousness and salvation in my day? Who knows how many times God intervened and impressed his will without my understanding in order to save me, in order to be my strong habitation, in order to be my rock and my fortress, in order to hold me up from my womb until now? Who knows how many times God has impressed himself into my life and done great and wondrous things which I knew not verse 17 continues it says oh God thou hast taught me from my youth and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works now also when I'm old and gray-headed oh God forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come now of course I have not been everything that I could be in the area of proclaiming God's righteousness and proclaiming his truth. I have not shown his strength the way I ought to. But when we can admit that, you know, when we desire that the way the psalmist does, that's when God takes our heart's desire and does great things with it to help us to improve and to grow. What do I mean by that? Well, where I stand now in my youth today, I didn't preach the gospel to everyone I should have. I didn't follow every command that I should have. I didn't obey God the way I ought to. But my heart's desire is that I would. When I'm gray-haired and, 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 and here the psalmist says, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come, he's saying, God, until you have used me to the extent that you see fit, I have showed your strength to this generation. I have showed your power to every generation that is to come after. Until I have done that, Lord, forsake me not. Do you know what that's saying? That's a, that's a humble heart saying, I know and can admit that there that I have fallen short even since my salvation. But if I can admit that, if we can admit that, there is still hope and opportunity for us to grow and, and to improve until the day that we are gray-headed. We are old, okay? This is telling us that we need to compare ourselves to him, okay? Because if I start comparing myself amongst ourselves, the Bible says that is not wise, okay? Because I might be able to easily tell myself that, oh, I, I'm living more righteously than Brother Joe over here. And I could compare myself with him and say, you know, I do this and do that, and I don't think he does this, and, and start to match myself up and start to think pretty highly, of, pretty highly of myself, you know? Maybe I do have this Christian life thing worked out because I can compare myself against one of my peers. No, we need to compare ourselves to Christ. When we compare ourselves 
ourselves to him, suddenly humility is pressed into our lives when we realize we're not what we should be, but we also realize in that state of humility that, that we can grow, we can improve. And that should be the desire of every Christian's heart. Verse 19, it says, Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? And that's the truth. Who is like unto our God? Who can compare themselves unto our God? None of us. So we should all understand that his righteousness is very high. He's the one that has done great things. I've done mediocre things at best. And the stuff that I've done in my own will and of my own righteousness is filthy rags in the sight of God. So what do I do? I trust in his righteousness, which is very high, who is like unto you, Lord. And I ask him and I beg him that he would not forsake me, not cease to use me, not cease to enter into my life and grow me in the areas of showing his strength and his power to every generation that is to come. God, don't stop using me. Don't give up on me. God, I wish that I could be as thou art, very high, doing great things. No one is like unto thee, God, but God, if you use me the way you you desire to hey I can at least be a shadow of what you are here on this earth I can at least be a little candlestick to the great light of the Sun that you represent help me God be in the way you ought to be strengthen me keep me from my enemies grow me and I will promise to praise you is what essentially David is gonna say here he says I'm low God is high no one is like our God look to God then Christian for him to do great things again in your life and he promises to do that verse 20 it says thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side quickening is promised that's that's life giving you you may be down right you may be in trouble Maybe you're flying high and you're feeling great right now, but you still need God's quickening strength. Because when we think we're great, we start to get puffed up. We start to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. You need God's strength to bring you down to where you can be humble enough for him to use them. When you're feeling down, you get the opposite problem. Sometimes we get puffed up and proud of our, of our, of our being downtrodden. And we start to say, oh, woe is me. And that's just more pride when, when I say, why, don't, why do I deserve to be living so low right now and be depressed and be sad? It's just another area another manifestation of pride in our lives but when that happens we need God's strength all the while and all the same way to quicken us again and bring us back to where he can adequately use us because we have the right heart and right spirit before him and David shows this throughout he reminds God of his great promises he asks God to bestow on him more promises he begs God to destroy his enemies that are hindering him he asks God to be with him as he was from the womb even to today he asks God to bring to remembrance all the things that he learned from his youth when he was saved when he was believing when he was following after God he says God be with me God help me to grow even when I'm old and gray-headed, he says, God, don't forsake me. Help me to show thy strength unto this generation and everyone which is to come. He says, God, you've showed me greatness. You've showed me sore troubles. Quicken me again. Bring me back to life. Bring me to where you want me. Increase my greatness and comfort me on every side because of your greatness. That's what he says. The Lord, the Lord, thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who has done great things, who is like unto thee. You are great. God, quicken me again and use me. Increase me in greatness, in your greatness. Comfort me on every side. He is begging. Verse 22 says, I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou holy one of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded and they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Okay, we're going to get attacked. And this is, this is kind of the thing, the theme that goes through this. There's going to be those that devise your hurt. Okay, it's, it's kind of like sewn into this passage as David is trying to grow in grace and trying to do more things for God and trying to stay on track. There's these that doubt 
him and his, his access to God. Those ones that, that persecute and try to take him. Those, those that are, are, are trying to bring him to the same confusion that they are under. Trying to cause hurt. Trying to cause shame in his life. Now, what do we do when all this is going on? When it's kind of, there's these attacks coming into our lives systematically, at random it seems sometimes maybe. When, when we're, we're facing sore troubles, when we're facing trials and tribulations, what do we do? Well, look what the psalmist does. He praises him. He sings praise unto God. He rejoices in all that God has done and continues to do in his life. He rejoices in God. He, 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 just, he, he says, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. Our redeemed soul ought to be just singing all the day long. That was a prayer that I had a long time ago. I didn't, I, I didn't feel like I had that song always in my heart. And I asked God, God, give me a song. And, and for a long time in my life afterwards, when I, when I clearly and distinctly asked God, that in prayer for God, my heart continued to rejoice when I sang praises unto him, and it happened from the moment that I woke up. Next, we need to boast in him, and that's what the psalmist does. He's always talking about the greatness of God. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things? The Lord has done great things. Who is like unto thee? The Lord, no one is like unto thee who has done great things. And when you're with God and walking with God in that, it seems like the enemy's attacks are just kind of, they're in there, but they're not really affecting the believer, are they? They're, they're, you can see them, you can, you can read of them, you can see him even asking, like in verse 12, God be not now far from me, but he's not worried and concerned and scared and troubled and moved by these attacks. Rather, they just drive him to praise God more to rejoice in him more, to boast in him more, and to grow in the things of God more. And that's what our constant life should be. An attack comes, go to God. Let God strengthen you. Show your weakness. Be weak before God in order that he could lift you up. He's your strong refuge. He's your deliverer. He's your strong habitation, your rock and your fortress. He will deliver you. He will keep you from the wicked man. And when he does allow the wicked men to intrude in your life, he's only doing that to destroy them and to lift you up in the end. So trust in him, believe in him, and be like the psalmist. Rejoice all the day long. Sing unto him. Give him proper glory. Praise him, rejoice, and boast about God all the day long as you walk and just watch him work in your life. That's what the psalmist is saying, and that's basically a, a, a key to living the Christian life even today. Thank you, Father, for this day.